It was not until the mid-17th century that glass blowers in Florence began to produce accurately calibrated thermometers. Now it became possible to measure degrees of hot and cold. Because rather than mercury, they used alcohol, which is much lighter, they made thermometers that were sometimes several meters long and were often wound into spirals. But there was still one major problem with all thermometers, the lack of a universally agreed temperature scale. There are all kinds of different ways of trying to stick numbers to these degrees of hot and cold, and they, on the whole, didn't agree with each other at all. So one guy in Florence makes one kind of thermometer, another guy in London makes a different kind, and they just don't even have the same scale. And so there was a lot of problem in trying to standardize thermometers. Imagine that you want to make a scale of temperature. What do you do? Well, the obvious thing to do, and this was well understood by instrument makers and experimenters in the 17th and 18th century, is to try and find something in nature which you know always has the same temperature and make that your fixed point. A better strategy even is to find two such phenomena in nature and then you have a lower fixed point something rather cold and an upper fixed point something rather warm and divide the degrees of temperature between into say a hundred convenient bite-sized chunks the problem however was to find to define a phenomenon whose temperature you guessed was fixed so for the lower fixed point you might choose the temperature of ice just as it's melting and then there's an almost indefinite range of possible candidates for your upper fixed point. Isaac Newton, for example, worked rather hard on constructing what he called a scale of heat. He, for example, uh, defined the temperature which a human can only just tolerate if they plunge their hand into warm water. It could be the normal human underarm, the temperature of the human blood, the temperature of wax just as it's melting. The first temperature scale to be widely adopted was devised by Daniel Fahrenheit, an accomplished instrument maker who made thermometers for doctors in Holland. He used a mixture of ice, water and salt for his zero degrees, ice melting in water at 32 degrees and for his upper fixed point the temperature of the human body at 96 degrees which is close to the modern value. One of the things that Fahrenheit was able to achieve was to make the momenters quite small and that he did by using mercury as opposed to alcohol or air which um, other people had used and because mercury thermometers are compact um, Clearly, if you're trying to use it for clinical purposes, you don't want some big thing sticking out of the patient. So um, the fact that he could make them small and convenient, that seems to be what made Fahrenheit so famous and so influential. It was a Swedish astronomer, Anders Celsius, who came up with the idea of dividing the scale into a hundred divisions. The original scale used by Celsius was upside down. So he had the boiling point of water as zero and the freezing point as 100, with numbers just continuing to increase as we go below freezing. And this is another little mystery in the history of the thermometer that we just don't know for sure. What was he thinking when he labeled it this way? And it was the botanist Linnaeus um, who was then the president of the Swedish Academy, who after a few years said, well, we need to stop this nonsense, and inverted the scale to give us what we now call Celsius scale today. A question nobody thought to ask when devising temperature scales was, how low can you go? Is there an absolute lower limit of temperature? The idea that there might be would become a turning point in the history of cold. Now put the beaker of 
The story begins with the French physicist Guillaume Amontou. He was doing experiments on uh, heating and cooling bodies of air to see how they expand and contract. We're now going to put ice around our bulb and see what happens. And he was noticing that, well, when you cool a body of air, the volume or the pressure would go down. And he speculated, well, what would happen if we just kept cooling it? By plotting temperature against pressure, Amonton saw that as the temperature dropped, so did the pressure. And this gave him an extraordinary idea. Amonton started to consider the possibility, what would happen if you projected this line back until the pressure was zero? And this was the first time in the course of history that people have actually considered the concept of an absolute zero of temperature. Zero pressure, zero temperature. It was quite a revolutionary idea when you think about it, because you wouldn't just think that temperature has a limit of a lower bound or zero, because in the upper end, it can go on forever, we think, until it's hotter and hotter and hotter. But somehow, maybe there's a zero point where this all begins. So you could actually give a calculation of where this um, zero point would be. Amontong didn't do that calculation himself, but some other people did later on. And when you do it, you, you get a value that's actually not that far from the modern value of roughly minus 273 centigrade. In one stroke, Amonton had realized that although temperatures might go on rising forever, they could only fall as far as this absolute point. For him, this was a theoretical limit, not a goal to attempt to reach. Before scientists could venture towards this zero point, far beyond the coldest temperatures on Earth, they needed to resolve a fundamental question. By now, for most scientists, the penny had dropped, the cold was simply the absence of heat. But what was actually happening as substances warmed or cooled was still hotly debated.